your Bible to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, while you're turning there, I did neglect to mention one thing. Uh, for the men who have not signed up, Philip uh, has a copy of one of these. Uh, and he is going to be completing the uh, sheet or the sign up for men who want to participate uh, in the program uh, this evening. So if you would like to be part of the men's uh, leadership night, there, there's still opportunity for you to do that. All you can do is go see Philip, uh, grab one of the sheets, and Try to do that uh, as quickly as you can uh, after services. Uh, there are slots left, uh, but there aren't many uh, slots left. So if you want to be a part, make sure that you do that. There was once an Idaho sheep rancher. I don't know if I've ever told you this story a lot. There was once an Idaho sheep rancher who one day while he was out with his animals was approached by a man who was wearing a suit. The man comes up to the Government. 
in some people see government as they would say a social gospel. It only makes the world a better place to go to hell from. In other words. Some people, some people give up hope and, and believe that we have passed beyond the point of, uh, of return. And when it comes to things such as morality and so on. And some people drop out because they see politics as kind of dirty and, and contaminating and any kind of attachment they have to it is simply attachment to a corrupt idea that has nothing but wicked intentions. And some people drop out because they are simply intimidated by groups that they perceive as part of our government process as being anti-Christian. And that their voice is simply being silenced by these groups. Sometimes we forget about what Paul says in Romans chapter 13. Something that especially in a year like this, we need to be reminded. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, Paul says that every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not terrorists to good conduct, but the bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good. And you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of the God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all who is owed to them. For what is owed to them? Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. In a day in which there is no respect for government, Paul, when we remind ourselves of these scriptures, tells us we have to have respect for government. See, that's not the only thing he tells us. See, Paul doesn't begin with the question. Paul doesn't begin with the question, should we be in subjection to our government? He assumes that and states it in the affirmative. But then goes on to explain how we can be a better citizen, citizenry under that government. But there are several things I want to point out about these passages. I want to kind of take them, sort of unpack them. Unpack them for us and, and consider what our attitude should be. What are the obligations of, of government? What are our obligations toward our government? What does the idea of government even begin to mean when it comes to the scripture? What does Paul mean when he says, subject to the governing authorities? What does that mean? Well, let's begin that. Since that's where Paul begins, let every person be subject to governing authorities. In other words, you have to recognize, you have to pay reverence, and you have to be respectful and know the authority of these, quote, governing authorities. But what is a governing authority? I think we understand these other ideas. I think most of us know what it means to be subject to something. What does he mean, governing authorities? The human government, he says, is ordained by God. There is no authority beyond what can be had from God. Thus, government exists because God has created it. There's a guy that made Warren Weird who wrote a set of commentaries it, as well as some other books. He said this, he says, God has established three institutions, the home, the church, and government. Ordained means originated from God. In other words, government is God's idea. Government is God's idea. But then the question naturally arises, well, what if government is bad? What if government is a bad thing? I mean, what if they do bad things? What if they promote bad things? What if they promote things that are contrary to the will of God? And we ask that question today because we look around and we see that, yeah, there are things that aren't right in our world. And 
some of those things are caused by the governing authorities. But you know as bad as we think we have it? Try to remember the days in which the book of Romans was written. Anybody remember who is just coming into power at the time of Paul's writing the book of Romans? A guy that you and I know by the name of Nero. He's a pretty good guy, right? No, not a good guy at all. Matter of fact, most people think that he was literally insane. This is the guy who, who, who essentially found out that his wife was pregnant, didn't like the idea for one reason or another, and decided to kick her to death. Along with the baby. This is the same guy who would take Christians after blaming them for the burning of Rome, run them through with large pointy sticks, give them in tar, and use them to light the dark. It's in this day when these type of people are in power that Paul says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Oh, what are you saying here? To respect to the governing authorities. Because the power that they have is, is from God, or at least it's God's idea that we have this organization, that we have these powers that are appointed over us. Government authorities is literally powers that be here. We're not just talking about the President of the United States. We're not just talking about the office of the President of the United States. For the Congress. Or any of those other offices. He's talking about people who are appointed to position of power or the powers that be. That guy who roams your neighborhood looking for stray pets who's been given the position and the authority to catch those stray animals? He has authority. He's got to respect everybody from the president on down to the dog catcher. They said, therefore, whoever resists, whoever opposes the order or resists the authority opposes the ordinances of God. So it's not just a matter of government being a system of organization for a nation, for a city, for a state. We have to realize that these things are the ordinances of God. And if we oppose the ordinances for that government under which we live, then we are opposing God. If we show them disrespect, then we are disrespecting God. You know, it kind of reminds me of what Christ said. It's a little different vein of things, but what Christ said in, in, in Matthew chapter 25. You remember the whole sheep goat conversation? Gets down to the people who are being condemned, and it says, you know, when did we see you, you know, naked and hungry and all of these things? You know, if we'd have seen you, we'd actually done something about it, Jesus. And he points to the people and he says, as much as you did it to them, you did it to me. In other words, we find our actions in the realm of men impacting the relationship that we have with God. And government is no different. The respect or disrespect we show for or against our government directly impacts our relationship with God. So I think first and foremost, what we have to realize is, is that this is not something we can simply tune out. This is not a process that we can simply drop out of. See, Paul, when he wrote these words, is essentially telling the child of God, you have got to be involved here. There's something for you to do in this relationship between you and the powers that be. Now, what kind of powers that be? Well, Time's the best. Some people, I'm sure, would argue that, you know, monarchy is it, it, the best. And some people would say, you know, oligarchy, where a few people kind of rule. That's got to be the best type of government, you know, maybe it comes to the kitchen type of thing. Some people say, well, you know, a democracy. Other things. You know, the Rome over the course of their history was a monarchy, a republic, a principate. And about the time Paul is writing, they're under emperor rule. 
So we take one empire and under which we, these children of God lived, and we find that they had different types of governing sounds throughout the of their history. God never said to either one of them that any of them are any better than the others, let alone the society that we live in. Why, why all the horrible things? 
know his power and his might. Now, does that mean you're going to understand it? No, maybe not. Do you think those people who were in bondage in Egypt understood exactly what's going on? As a matter of fact, when Moses is told, hey, you're going to have to go back there, you're going to have to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. His first question isn't about whether or not Pharaoh is going to let him go, is it? You remember what his first question is about? First question, if I'm getting in the right order. You know, maybe I did. Let's just say one of the first questions is about will the people accept me? Will my own people see me as an authority? Will they understand what it is that I'm trying to do? Or will they say, who are you? And who is this God that you're speaking about? Tell us something. Moses wasn't convinced that these people understood. And Moses himself doesn't seem convinced that he understood exactly what God was doing. When he moved the nations, when he rose up Pharaoh, and he showed his mouth power and his might. God has brought into being all of these different forms of government in different times of man's existence to display his power. I know. Sometimes the temptation is to kind of think of our limited era of time. But anytime we begin to speak in government circles and political realms, Try to put it in the larger context of what God is trying to do in the world. See, America has been blessed with a republic for what, 236? Is that right? 236 years? Somebody do the math for the math people. You, you can do the math, right? 236 years, right about there. Because there were people who wanted to stand up and say, we're free. 236 years we have had a republic class. We've got to take the warning of the words of those people who found the form of government. One of which said this, our form of government is meant for the rule of a religious and moral people it is wholly inadequate for any other form. Our form won't work for a people without principle or conscience, but will degenerate chaos. There may be a day when this form of government doesn't exist. Like we don't have Roman emperors anymore. Like we don't read about oligarchies anymore. Or autonomous collectives or whatever form of government you want to bring up. God works in the kingdoms of men. God gives authority to whom he will give authority to show his power and his money. If you go back to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 6, you don't have to turn there right now. Isaiah is disturbed. And, and he's discouraged. It's the king of, uh, of it's the reign of, uh, during the time of uh, the reign of King Uzziah. Uh, and he, he's a good king, but he ends up dying. Uh, he ends up dying. And he rules for, for decades. He rules for decades. I'm sorry, I'm not a king, but he rules for decades. But even in the midst of all the chaos that was that ancient empire, Isaiah has this vision. His eye was dead, but he saw God still on the throne. Kings come and kings go, presidents come and presidents go. But the authority that gives them authority to act is always there. And God's not advocating that problem. So there is government. Government begins and ends and moves with God's will. But what is the requirement of government? Look at verses 3 and, and, and 4. Back to the book of Romans. Chapter 13. Verses 3 uh, and verse uh, 4. He says... <coughs> For the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the, of, of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant 
for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he who, excuse me, he is the servant of God and the man who carries out God's wrath on the wrong doer. Number one, the requirements of government are to restrain evil. To restrain evil. Go so far as to say he does not bear the sword in, in vain. In, in other words, if you're an evildoer, you ought to fear your government. You ought to fear your government. If you're a speeder, if your town has speed limits, you ought to be afraid of the camera, of the policeman, or whatever it is that's going to give you that ticket. And it's right that you should feel that way. Because government is there to restrain evil. You know, now sometimes, sometimes people say, well, you can't legislate morality. And in a sense, I agree with you, but in a very limited sense. While it might be true, we can't compel people to legitimately and sincerely who would see as moral. It is not true that we should not have laws that forbid immorality. There is not a law on earth to make you a moral person. But that's why we legislate against morality. I like what one person said. He said this. No law can make you love me, so I need one to keep you from killing me. No law can make you honest, so we need one to keep you from stealing. Government is not there to make you good, but to keep you from evil. God's purposes in this world are contrary to evil. Contrary to the things that are contrary to Him. Another thing we want to point out is this little line about the sword. He does not bear the sword in vain. The sword that is meant here is more specifically an executioner's sword. You go back to the Old Testament and you couple that with some Old Testament kind of. Uh, Revealings uh, of the personality and of the nature uh, of God in places like Genesis chapter 9 and Exodus chapter 20 and, and Exodus 21. And, and you read those chapters. You read all about God's opposition to the things that, that are evil. What you come away with, especially when you combine it with uh, Romans chapter 13, is that our government is there to restrain evil to the point of being able to take people's lives. When we commit crimes against them. We may not read about jails and prisons in the churches, but we do read about restitution for crimes. We do read about justice exacted by God to the point of taking a man's life, if it means saving the state. I love this story that was once told about Henry VIII, who doesn't really have a good reputation, but perhaps in this instance. It says, Henry VIII once pardoned a man who then went out later and committed a murder. When he killed the man, a friend asked him to again pardon the man. A second time, after he killed a second person, the man comes and says, please pardon me. And Henry said, no. He killed the first man. I killed the second man. He will kill no more. I think that's a pretty decent picture of what we find in Scripture. There is a time which government should rise up and take the evildoer from among us. Maybe personal opinion. But I think it's absolutely ridiculous that it takes 20, sometimes more plus years, for the people who labor in such endeavors to figure out that this fellow needs to be done with. Right. Number two, government should be a rewarder of that which is good. 
Not only do they punish that which is evil, they should reward that which is good. You should be praised. Praise those who want to live uh, as good citizens, who want to live within the confines of the law. Have you ever had anybody come up to you and say, you know, we really appreciate how you, you live a good and honest life? You know, it seems like we only see the negative side, right? You know when you get the speeding ticket, you've broken the law. But how many times have you been pulled over by the police officer and you just simply said, sir, I wanted to let you know I appreciate you going to speed. How many people here feel appreciated by your government? Yeah, see, not too many people do. So maybe we're not exactly doing real well, even on the positive side here. But government should be a rewarder of those that are good. And they should encourage that which is right, especially that which is morally right. You have to honor good citizens. And that's the job of, uh, of our government. Along with that, government should set the example of doing what is right. The government institutions should set the example, set the bar, set the standard for treating people as they should. And unfortunately, that's not often the case. It's not often the case. And when you look around and, and, and you See that it doesn't always work out that way. In fact, it, it, it pops up in our language from time to time. Anybody had ever heard the saying, well, there's not the government work? Ever heard that? In, in other words, what that means is I work for the government so I can give substandard performance. Or as a people, we should expect substandard performance from our government officials. So that's key. Yeah. Or anyway. Government institutions, or if we work for a government institution, we should be setting the standard of what is right and what is true and, and what is good. And what about the Christian's obligation towards the government? We have an obligation to. We have to render to them what is due. That taxes to whom taxes do, custom to whom custom is due. Basically, respect to whom respect is due. The simple fact of the matter is you live in a world that has expenses. You drive on roads that cost money to build. You do your business in buildings and things of that nature that have a certain price tag. Governments need to operate, and therefore you are indebted to them. Now you may not like paying the tax man, and you may think that you have to pay too much. But we must render under Caesar's that which is before we go into the words of Paul in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, where we're told to pray for those who are in authority that we might live peaceful and tranquil lives. In other words, we become servants of, of them who lead us in these government ways. Just a matter of your tax dollars. It also be 
be a part of bringing a sense of morality to the process that we can. It means both. It means you need a Christian voice and the influence. See, if we had a, a, a citizenry, a citizenry, where it just does not come out right now, that had a foundation in ingrained and an overwhelming sense of morality, then I would imagine that eventually that would lead into what we feel is a corruption within our government halls. But where does that start? Start call it one vote. And if you think perhaps that one vote doesn't count, you've probably heard the, the facts about the one vote. 1645, Oliver Cromwell took control over England. One vote. 1776, Americans have English as the official language instead of German. By one vote. 1845, kept Andrew Jackson from impeachment. By one vote. 1876, made Rutherford B. Hayes the president. Finally, 1923, gave Hitler the leadership of the Nazi Party. By one vote. See, your voice counts. Your obligation to your government counts, so don't be sour. Don't, don't be disturbed. Instead, read through the words of Paul. Read through the words of Paul and accept the obligation that he says. Render unto your government and love your God. Those things that you require. See, during Paul's day, the Roman government fulfilled the Colosseum with 50,000 or more. 50,000 or more, you watch Christians be murdered by wild animals and from sport. It was the age of the, the gladiator, so to speak, and it was the age of the death of many. A child of God. But sometimes the story that is not told is that underneath of that Colosseum, in those catacombs, were Christians who would pray for these games to end. Would pray for the day when you could be a Christian and not be killed for it. And I would dare say that you and I are bearing the fruit of those prayers today. Let us not. That our opportunity slips. But let us be the cause. Let us not let the frustration of others keep us from doing what is good and right and godly. For God's plans are far bigger than any government's. So there to be our concern. I close with this one passage. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. When my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will hear, heal their land. You want your land to be healed? You want your government to do what it's supposed to do? You want to not be frustrated anymore? You want to not grow greed weary and running in those political and government circles? Let it begin on your knees. Let it begin with you. The personal relationship that you have with Christ. When you're here this morning, you don't, you don't really have that closeness. I'm not here as word to say. Let that word produce in you a, a faith. Strong conviction. Let that strong conviction lead you to want to do something about your sins. Change your mind. Repent of those things. Let repentance lead you to naturally confess that Christ is the Son of the living God, the only one that can wash away my sins and go into the waters of baptism, have them washed away, so you can rise to walk in newness of life. A life of hope, a life of purpose, a 
life of being, the life that is full. Regardless of where you live, regardless of who's in power, always bent on doing the will of God. And you've done that, you simply need to get back to that focus on Him. You need to see beyond your circumstances. 